this is a special event. It is the Heisman Trophy of defense. It is the award that gives back to a side of the ball that doesn't get as much glory. Thank you, Charlotte. What a high level of excellence Ronko Nagurski brought to the game. He's an inspiration to anyone who loves the game of football. My football story is not about playing for the Carolina Panthers. My football story is from the time I was five years old, all I ever wanted to do was play for Wayne Hills High School in northern New Jersey. I was a part of something, and the purpose of what we were working for was greater than any one of us. We come out every day to compete, and the only way we can get better is we, you know, compete against each other hard. It's important to note that sometimes the signs that we ask for are right there in front of us. Win or lose, there was always a message in there. It's about what we do with the adversity we face. He can have a dream, but you better be prepared for that opportunity. It's a lot of hard work. I mean, it's, it's nothing is given. I mean, you have to earn everything. I'm honored to be here today. You do such wonderful work. The funds you raise for scholarships around the area, uh, that's wonderful. A very heartfelt thank you to members of the Touchdown Club for your support of 16,000 plus students who you all are impacting annually. Studies show that GPAs and graduation rates are higher, absences and dropout rates are lower. What I've learned in my life is you can accomplish anything in this world. If you want to do something bad enough, you'll find a way. But it's important that everybody in this room and beyond understands that it starts with us. You see these kids on the come up, you got to let them know. Football was a gladiator sport. Only gladiators play football. Tonight, you're going to get a glimpse of excellence of our finalists and what they have brought to this game. Their dedication, passion, and brute strength, along with their ability to make key plays during crucial moments in big games. The Football Writers Association of America and the Charlotte Touchdown Club are proud to present the 2020 Bronco Nagurski Trophy to Zayvon Collins from the University of Tulsa. Thank you to the Football Writers Association for presenting me this trophy and you know selecting me to be Nagurski winner. Thank you to Charlotte Touchdown Club and uh, Lending Tree for um, you know entrusting with me and, and be, uh, putting my name on the trophy. It really means a lot to me. You know, him winning this award is just a tribute to him, his family, our program, this university. He's going to lead those guys to some wins too. I really believe Sam can play well. Growing up around the game, I have a deep and abiding respect for those who have paved the way. Bronco Nagurski was a true pioneer of our game. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Stephen Israel. I'm connected to the Touchdown Club because I'm a former player, played 10 years in NFL, enjoyed every minute, and uh, now I'm living in lovely Charlotte, North Carolina, just like all of you, and loving it. I uh, currently work at the private bank, Bank of America, private client advisor. And just want to thank all of you guys for coming out today. We're going to have a lot of fun. We have an awesome luncheon, as usual, because that's how John Rocco plans it, right? Oh, that's low. That's how John Rocco plans it, right? <laughs> all right, we're going to have some fun. We want to uh, thank all of our Touchdown Club sponsor members and guests for today's uh, event. Also, obviously, our lead sponsor, Ma Martin Mariota, and uh, media partners, WBT and WFNZ. Uh, now, please put your hands together. We're going to welcome Sister Janice McQuaid from uh, St. Stephen's Church to do our invocation. Good afternoon. Many thanks to the Charlotte Touchdown Club, to my friend John Rocco, and to Andy Kudlisurto for inviting me to lead us in prayer today. It is truly a blessing that we're all able to gather again, isn't it? You're supposed to say, Amen. <laughs> so together, let us reverence God's presence within us and among us.
gracious God, giver of life and lover of us all. This weekend, we celebrate the beginning of summer and Father's Day. We pray for all our fathers living and deceased. We pray for all the fathers that are gathered here today. Grace them with a deep faith, with courage and hope. Grace them to lead their families by good example, to love, respect, and encourage their wives. Grace them to protect their families and to be their families minister of defense against all that could harm them. May these days of summer renew our spirits and deepen our hope. Bless the Carolina Panther organization, the team, the family, and the fans. Bless the food that we share. Bless all the hands that work so hard to bring it to our table, to those who prepared it, and to the wonderful people who serve us today. May this meal bless and strengthen us, that we can bless and strengthen in your name. And to this we say, amen. Hope everyone enjoyed their lunch. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I want to just thank everyone for coming out again today uh, to enjoy this awesome luncheon and uh, obviously listen to our awesome speaker. Also, I want to ask all, all the guests, I want to ask you all you guys to recognize and patronize the more than 60 Touchdown Club team member sponsors to, on the videos you'll see to my left and to my right. Uh, we have awesome sponsors that make this day uh, really, really special. Uh, next up, uh, the Touchdown Club would like to thank Crown Sports Sales and Rydell for their continued support for the jerseys, the helmets, throughout the entire year. I mean, these, these helmets that you see, the balls is on the tables, every, every luncheon that we have, it, it really goes to those guys. And we want to thank those guys for supporting us and being a sponsor of that. Uh, next, uh, I want to ask Miss Sarah. Miss Sarah Baker is going to be my helper. We have the raffle time. Now, with these raffles, we want to keep things moving so we have a lot of time to hear our special speaker, OK? How you doing, Sarah? You ready? All right, the lights are on. You, you come alive when it's game time, right? <laughs> All right. All right, the first raffle will be, uh, you're going to pick it? All right. The first one would be a Bears helmet autographed by Mike Singletary, Mike Singletary, and the number is 230. The last three numbers is 230. One, four, four, two, three, zero. Bears helmet autographed by Mike Singletary. We got it? All right, come on up. When we call your number, if, you, if you're the winner, you come up and, and, get your, and claim your prize. The next item is the Bears logo football autographed by Mike Singletary. And the winner is 178. 144, 178. 178. It's a Bears logo football autograph by Mike Singletary. We got a winner? All right, got it. Good. Third item is a Bears mini helmet autographed by Mike Singletary. The Bears mini helmet is number three item. Mike Singletary autograph. That winner is 042. 042. 144042. Got a winner. Come on up. Congratulations, sir. The last item is a 2019 Bronco Nagurski football autograph by the five finalists Derek Brown, Chase Young, Isaiah Simmons, Antoine Winfield Jr., and J.R. Reed. Bronco Nagurski football helmet, 2019 finalist, Derek Brown, Chase Young, Isaiah Simmons, Antoine Winfield Jr., and J.R. Reed. And the winner is 195. 144195. We got a winner. 
Congratulations, sir. Now, let's, let's talk about the centerpiece, that football. The winner of the, the centerpiece, don't take the stand, just the football. The winner of the centerpiece is the person that has the program with the bear sticker on the back that says, you are the winner. You are the winner. Now, you know in the past, normally we have a, a, a picture of Rocco and his Speedos, but we don't have that. It's just going to be a sticker with, you are the winner. So if you got it, congratulations to all the winners. Once again, please don't take the stands. <laughs> we, need the st we need the stands for next month's luncheon. All right, at this time, if I can have your attention, I have uh, some, some very challenging, uh, really challenging news to share. If I can have your attention for a moment. Uh, this past Friday, a week previous to today, um, here in Charlotte, we, we lost one of our football brethren. There's over close to, I believe the number is over 160 now, somewhere around 150 to 160 former NFL players that call Charlotte home. Our dear friend and a former NFL brother, Hesley Hempstead, we all know him as Hess, he attended probably 90% of these luncheons. He's, he passed away. So uh, we just want, along with John Rocco, he was good friends with John and the Touchdown Club, along with uh, the table to my right, all the other former players in here. We'd just like you to say an extra prayer for his wife and, and his daughters and uh, for his family. Uh, really, really tough situation in losing Hess Hempstead. So I uh, really appreciate it if you say an extra prayer for him and his family. Uh, next, we have uh, also with us today uh, a lot of special guests as far as former players. We have uh, Michael Dean Perry, we have Eugene Robinson, Rod Smart, current NFL PA president here in Charlotte, Colin Cole. We have a uh, very beloved <laughs> Mike Rucker. We have Leonard Wheeler, uh, Jim Maxwell, and also uh, we have a special group of men and women that make up our high school, middle school coaches, athletic directors, and administrators at CMS. And also, we happen to have their CEO with us today, uh, the C CMS school superintendent, Mr. Ernest Winston. Can you please have a round of applause for all these guests with us today? Thanks. I'm sure all the former players here would agree with me. Uh, we, we all can sit back and say there's been a teacher, a principal, a superintendent, someone in high school, middle school that really touched our lives and was near and dear and helped shape and mold us to be the men we are today. Uh, but so often only coaches get, get, get a lot of the fame and the glory, and rightfully so, but there, there's teachers that have really done an awesome job to be truly a blessing to us. And so we just want to obviously acknowledge that. Now, uh, I want to share with you the first time I met our guest speaker. The NFL uh, has annual conferences of all sorts throughout the year, and, but mainly during the offseason. And one of them that is really big and popular is called PAO, Professional Athletes Outreach. And they do an awesome job. And so I think it might have been my second year or third year, uh, I was with the LA Rams at the time, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to our first PAO conference. And at that conference, uh, one, of the peop one of the players, former players that always did an awesome job speaking and one of the leaders uh, from a former player standpoint was Mike Singletary and his lovely wife. And um, it was awesome getting an opportunity to meet Mike Singletary because at that time, I wasn't the 50 year old guy I am now. I was like 24, 25. And what was going through my mind is all the games that I sat and watched him. But I just want to share something 
that a lot of people don't know. Yes, you do know he is a Hall of Fame football player. But what you may not realize is at the same level and higher, he's a Hall of Fame father and a Hall of Fame husband. So we're going to watch the video. And after that video, we're going to have Mike Singletary address our awesome luncheon. Thank you. In 1984 and 85, the NFL's number Everyone, please help me welcome Mike Good afternoon. Um, very honored to be here. Um, I'm grateful that my wife was able to come with. We were traveling um, from uh, Hawaii yesterday. Uh, we were there with um, <clears throat> some AG attorney generals uh, from around the country, and uh, we're listening to them talk about some of the issues that they have to solve. So very uh, honored to be here. Um, football for me is, um, is just special. There's no other way to put it. Um, very thankful to have had the opportunity to play the game. And uh, when I think back on it, you know, being the last of 10 kids, being the smallest of 10 kids, uh, including my sisters. <laughs> That's not a joke. Um, it, it was just an, an interesting opportunity. But everything in my life started when I was 12 years old. At 12 years old, everything changed in, in my life because my mom and dad divorce, and my brother Grady, who was next to me in the uh, family line, was killed in an automobile accident uh, about six months after my dad left my mom. And there I was at 12 years old uh, trying to figure it out and really thinking at that time that life just was not fair. You know, I watched mom and dad and, and the dynamics of that relationship. And my mom scratching and kicking, trying to do everything she could to make it work. It just didn't. And then my brother Grady, right after my dad leaves, is killed in an automobile accident. And, and there I am trying to figure this thing out. And I'm thinking, life just isn't fair. So at that time, I made a conscious decision to just kind of be mediocre. I said, I, I, I don't want to be the best because I, I've seen what happens when you try to be the best at anything. People start not liking you. They start finding things to say about you. You know, who do you think you are? Oh, they think they're better than everybody else. And I, I didn't want to be the worst either, because then no one wants you on their team. So I thought, if I could just be in the middle, if I could just be mediocre, I, I think that's the sweet spot. My mom walks into the kitchen as I'm making that decision consciously. And she knows me very well. She said, son, I want you to sit down. I need to talk to you about this thing called life. I know that you're hurt. I know that you're frustrated. But I want you to know that greatness is in you. You're my, you're my last child. And I knew there would be something special in you. And son, if you give up now, you will never see all of the great things in your life. She said, I want you to understand what life is really all about. Life is all about when you get punched in the gut. 
finding a way to get up and dust yourself off and get back in the ring and just keep swinging, son. Just keep swinging. And then she asked me the question that changed my life. She asked me if I could be the man of the house. I said, son, I know this is not a fair question. I know you're only 12 years old. But I need you right now. And I need to know if you can do this for me. And I'm sitting there and I'm arguing with her about finding a job and trying to help out financially. She says, no, 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 I got all of that. I just need you to be the man of the house. If you can take care of that, I got the rest. And I looked at her and I, I realized that she really believed in me. And you know, one of the things that my wife and I have seven kids, and one of the things that I really try and have them do is understand that I believe in them. It is amazing the power that you give someone. And everybody knows when somebody's looking at you and they're looking at you with their heart and they're saying, I believe in you. Are you going to let them down? I don't think so. I said, Mom, I can do that. Right after that conversation, I go in my room, I get out a sheet of paper, and I write out my vision statement. I, I don't really know how it came about. I was always a dreamer. And, and I think I, for the first time, I just wrote what was in my heart. And it sounded like this. Find a way to get a scholarship, go to college. Get my degree in which I be the first in my family to do so. Become an All-American. Get drafted, go to the NFL buy my mom a house, and take care of her for the rest of her life. Become an all-pro, go to the Super Bowl, and own my own business. I wrote that out at 12 years old, and I put it on my wall. And every day, I would come in and I would look at it. And I wasn't even playing football at the time. Football season had already started. And I had never played organized football. I'm still trying to figure out how to have my mom, how to convince her to let me play. The season had already started. First week had already went by, and I'm still trying to muster up the guts to ask her. But I know that I got to play. There's no way that I can live this life and not play the game. When I see the game, man, I'm like, that's it. <laughs> I got to play. I love this game. So finally I asked my mom, Mom, I know you don't know anything about football. I, I don't know that much myself. But I know I got to play. And I'm asking you, Mom, let me play the game. Mom said, son, you're too small. You know you're too small. You know the doctor said that you know, you're going to have it tough, and, you know, you're just now getting healthy and all of those things. And I said, Mom, please let me play. Just let me play. Give me a chance. If I get hurt, then take me out. With that, she said, okay. Wow. I get a chance to go out and play football. I get the last suit available. I'm going to a poor school. We don't have a lot of equipment. I got the last suit available. I'm putting my helmet on, it's wobbly. I'm putting my shoulder pads on, they're flopping around. Got a jock strap, had no idea what to do with that. <laughs> my pants are falling down to my ankles and I'm jogging out to the field. 
Coach looks up and he sees me and he says, oh, wait, 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 who are you? Uh, coach, uh, I want to play. You want to play what? Football? Where you been? Son, we've been out here working. Yes, sir. You want to play football? Yes, sir. I tell you what, come over here. Come here. Come here. Let, let's solve this right now. If you can tackle Cookie, you can play. I'm looking at the guys. I'm thinking, I can handle that. Coach says, uh, Cookie. Cookie was in the back of the pile. Cookie says, yeah. <laughs> Cookie's walking out from behind the pack there, whiskers sticking out of his face mask. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Coach comes over to me and he said, look here. This is where we separate the men from the boys. He drew a line behind my, my heels. He said, if Cookie takes you past this line, we're going to have a problem. And he walks over to Cookie and he says, Cookie, if you don't take him past that line, you're going to have a problem. You understand? Cookie says, yes. Yeah. Coach blew the whistle, cookie drugged me all over the field. I was screaming the whole time. Finally, Coach blew the whistle, he came over and he picked me up off the ground. I'm looking at him out of my ear hole. He says, uh, hey boy, look at here, look at here, son. You got something. You didn't let go. I like that. You're going to be my middle linebacker. He said, you know what that is? I said, no, sir. He said, the middle linebacker is the guy that stands behind the line of scrimmage and he hits everything that moves. I like that. And from that day on, that's what I played. Middle linebacker. And as I learned about what a middle linebacker does, he's a leader. He has to know the plays. He has to call the defense. He's the one that's supposed to know everything that's happening. He's the quarterback of the defense. Of the defense. Wow. That was fantastic. I love playing middle linebacker. I begin to read about middle linebackers and what they do and their characteristics. I begin to watch film about middle linebackers. I begin to watch Dick Buckus and Mike Curtis and Willie Lanier, all those great guys that played middle linebacker, trying to find out how did they become great. As I think back on that time, it's, it's amazing how people always look at them. I'm looking at some of the young men that I met today. They go, wow, man, you're Hall of Famer. You, you did great things, whatever, but there's a process. There's a process in there that most people just don't understand. And that process is full of failures and setbacks and difficult times and times that you think you're not going to make it and a ton of people telling you that you'll never make it. And that is the story of my life. And the one thing that I've learned about life is there is always that long line of people to tell you, can't wait to tell you that you can't do it, that you can't make it, that you don't have what it takes. It's never happened for guys like you. I remember when I wrote that out and I put it on my wall, my vision statement, even some of my own siblings came in and said, who do you think you are? Man, we, none of us have done anything like this. You think you're going to do this? Some of them laughed. Some of them were angry. And I'm standing there and all I can say, you wait and see. And there were days, man, I went to practice and I'd come home and I'd rip it off the wall and throw it in the trash because I didn't feel like I was going to make it. That day was a long day. Man, I couldn't do anything right. Missing every tackle. I, I, I couldn't go the right direction. But it was something in my heart that I knew that's why I knew it was a vision statement because I just could not sleep without looking at my wall and seeing it up there. And I'd write it out and I'd put it back up there. It was sometimes late at night, man. 
We didn't have an air conditioning. If you know anything about Houston, Texas, it's really humid there. You'd raise the windows up sometimes, maybe a breeze would come in. If it didn't, you know, the mosquitoes would uh, oftentimes join it and wear you out. But I'd get up at night, midnight, one in the morning, two, go outside, and I'd just start running. Man, I'm running forwards, I'm running backwards, I'm running sideways as fast as I could. At the same time, with tears in my eyes. Don't know how I'm going to make it. Don't know how it's going to happen. Don't know when I'm going to see the first light at the end of the tunnel. All I know is every day I got to try again. And you know what? When I think about that, I think about our country and I think about where we are. And I think it's so easy to quit today. Sometimes I really sit down and I think about our young people. I think about my own kids. Man, do you know that period there? Do you know that dead period, that process? Well, you got to prove yourself where you hear those voices. You're not going to make it. You're not good enough. You don't have what it takes. You're never going to get there. Nobody that's from your neighborhood has ever made it there. Nobody from your line can do this. And you know what? It's so easy to give in. I've talked to young men all my life. I sit down and they say, well, how do I become great? Tell me, how do I become great? And you begin to tell them, it takes this, it takes that, it takes this, it, ta it, it takes all of that. You mean every day? Yeah, every day. And it's the one that say, I got to do all that? You need to say right now, you know what, time out, you wasted my time, you're not going to make it. It's the one that says, is there more? I'm telling them, you got to do this, and you got to do that, and you got to do this, and you got to do that every day. Is there more? Is that all? Because that's all I wanted to know. I tried to find someone that was the best. I tried to find someone that I could trust. I tried to find someone who knew what I needed to do in order to get there. And I would ask them, what do I need to do? to be the best? What do I need to do to be great? What do I need to do to get a scholarship? And once you tell me, I'm going to write it down, and guess what? I'm on it. I am on it. What dreams do you have today? You know my story. What's yours? I don't care if you're 12, if you're 25, if you're 35, if you're 45, 55, 65. What's your dream, man? Our world needs you. You see that sign and Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam wants you. In our country right now, we're in need of leaders. We're in need of people that will stand up, don't care about the ridicule, don't care about social media, don't care about being politically correct. Care about my family. Care about my country. Care about my destiny. Care about my marriage care about my kids, care about my grandkids. Yes, all of that. Are you up for it? When I look at my career and I look at the things that I've been able to do, I'm so grateful for the people that stood in the gap for me. When I didn't feel like I could go any further, this guy that I met in high school, 
You know, we all need people along the way. And you got to recognize them when they come. I met a guy for about five minutes, and it changed my life as a player. It was my junior year in high school, and all of my teammates and some of my coaches were saying, Mike, you know, if you want to go Division I, you probably need to play safety. You probably need to play corner because you're not big enough. You're just not big enough. But I'm saying, but, but I'm a middle linebacker. That's what I do, man. That's what I am. I'm a middle linebacker. Yeah, but, but, but in high school, that's great. But do you see every year? Every year, man, these linebackers that get scholarships to Division I schools, they're like 6'2", 6'3". They're like 230, 225. Two, you're five. 10, 195, what are you going to do with that? And I'm thinking to myself, they don't get it. They don't get it. And there's a part of me that was a little bit scared. But my junior year in high school, I'm sitting in my class, and I've got about four or five teammates to come to my, my uh, homeroom and go, hey, Mike, you got to come see this guy. You got to come see this guy. Mike, I'm telling you, you got to come see this guy. Everything that we've been telling you is true. This guy just got cut. He graduated from college. He went to the Kansas City Chiefs, and he didn't make their team. And, Mike, you got to see how big he is. This guy is like 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 he's like 240. And he didn't make it. How do you think you're going to have a chance? And I'm thinking, okay, wh where is he? And I go down to the gym, and this guy was just kind of looking at several schools to try to figure out his coaching career. He's going to start coaching. His name was Durfee Thompson. I go to practice that day. We're in spring practice. And after practice, I'm going in. Jeffrey Thompson comes up to me. He says, hey, 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 Singletary. He said, man, I want to tell you something. If I had what you have, what I saw today, I'd still be playing. He said, you have it. You got that fire, that, that, that desire, man. You got it. And man, I'm telling you, I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. He said, now let me tell you something now. He said, now, this is what you got to do every day. You need to go from sideline to sideline as fast as you can, shuffling, making sure your feet don't cross over. You just got to keep shuffling. Just, just, just shuffle. Just shuffle back and forth, back and forth until you can't do it again. And when you can't do it again, rest a little bit and do it again. Do it again. And he said, next year, when they start coming, and at that time, no one was talking to me. He said, when they start coming next year, you get a chance, go to Oklahoma. And I'm thinking, Oklahoma? <laughs> Whoa, really? You think I can go to Oklahoma? I'm thinking this to myself. You know, to him, I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> sure enough, that next fall comes, and I got a visit got visited by Baylor University. And I went to visit Baylor. Then I got a second visit from the University of Texas. And those were the only two offers that I had in Division I. 
really was only one because the University of Texas wanted me to block, be a fullback. And um, I said, I can't do that. I, I hate fullback. How, how can I? Uh, let me let me tell you real quick what I learned about, and I would I would do it. I don't know, but when I played middle linebacker, if anybody anybody seen the movie Waterboy, that's kind of how I played middle linebacker. That was my thought process. I didn't like those guys. Anybody that had the football, it was like. What, what, I've had guys ask me after the game, what are you taking, man? I need some of that. I said, I'm not taking anything. Oh, so you're not going to tell me what you're taking. I said, I'm not taking anything. Man, I know you're taking something. There's something wrong with you if you're not. <laughs> but, I, you know, I've never taken anything. But it, it's like, anyway, let me get back to the story. <laughs> so I ended up accepting the scholarship to Baylor. Love Coach Taft, who was the head coach at that time. I had a chance to really just, I, I just, we bonded right away. But at the end of the recruiting season, I had one visit from a guy from Oklahoma. And he came in and he said, uh, do you know who I am? I said, uh, no, sir. And he had about four or five championship rings on his finger. And he said, uh, I'm from Oklahoma. Now, you uh, visited Baylor, you visited Texas, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you know, you, Oklahoma is the best. Now, I heard you're pretty good, and I could tell he didn't know anything about me. I was just another guy. And when I told him that I was not coming to Oklahoma, he cursed me. He said, you, you got to be kidding me. You're going to go to Baylor? And I'm offering you a scholarship from Oklahoma? Did you know the difference between the two? But you know what? I, I, the only thing I can say about that is when you begin to talk about greatness, and, and that's, a, that's a word that a lot of people throw around today, greatness. Everybody's great today. Everybody gets a trophy today. Greatness to me, and I really believe this, I, I, I don't believe that you can compartmentalize greatness. Even as a Hall of Famer, there's not a day that goes by. Greatness to me is inside out. It's not outside in. Greatness to me is from the heart. Greatness to me is striving for excellence in everything that I do in the classroom, out of the classroom, in every walk of life, in my job, in anything that I do, striving to do it as best I can, striving to do it where I believe that God would be pleased. Greatness to me is being a great father, is being a great husband, it's being a great human being. It's being a, a great Christian. It's simply being the best that I can possibly be at everything that I'm doing. That's greatness. I don't believe that you can be great at work and come home and be a bad father and be great. I don't believe that. I don't believe that you can be a good man and have hate in your heart for others. I don't. I don't believe that. And I think in our society as we move forward, I think we have a decision to make. I think right now as, as America we're at a crossroad right now, man, and I'm telling you, we got to speak up fast. We got to do something fast. I think we just had the, the pandemic, 
And there's somebody that doesn't like us. There's, there's some countries out there that is not like America. They're looking at our people. They're looking at our resources. They're looking at how can they take us. And if we don't understand how much we need each other, we're going to fail. If we don't understand that I cannot be successful and go to sleep at night knowing that somebody on the other part of town are going to sleep tonight and they, they are going to bed and their kids are hungry and their kids do not have the same opportunity that my kids have, what can I do without thinking of what can I do to help? What can I do to make a difference? The older I get, the more I realize that there are three kind of people in this world. The people that say, and I hear it, <laughs> what's wrong with those people? And it's not just black people I'm talking about. I'm talking about anybody. What's wrong with those people? My grandfather came to this country. He had nothing. And he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and he made it. No help nothing, nothing from anybody. He made it. It's those people that say, I don't need anybody. I got this. I did this all by myself. Then there's the next group that says, I made it. And you know what? I'll help you too. As long as it doesn't cost me too much, I'll help you. The minute it becomes an inconvenience, no, I, I, that's as far as I'm going. And then there's the person that I really believe is the sign of a true American. Yes, I got mine. I worked for it. But if I know that somebody else have kids, and I know that they're going to bed tonight and they're hungry. They're going to bed tonight and they, they don't have school supplies. They're going to bed tonight and, and they don't know what's going to happen when daddy comes home, if he comes home. That bothers me. That bothers me. Does it bother you enough to do something? Now, I say that to say this. When you see Hall of Famers, when you see all Americans, when you see the best of the best, to me, this is what every one of them should be about. All means all. And I think as a country, we're right on the edge. We are one step away from all hell breaking loose. We are one step away from losing what can be something very, very special, our freedom, our freedom. That to me is worth fighting for, dying for if I have to. I'm going to 
to stop there and I'll take some questions. Are there any questions? Going once, going twice. <laughs> I've got uh, a mic out there, somebody. No question? Okay. All right, so the question was, young man said, he's not going to ask him who's the best running back that he knows because he already knows the answer to that, and I'm sure all of you know who he played with, and that's, I'm sure you understand that. And just for you who don't, just Google number 34 for the Chicago Bears, okay? <laughs> so then he said, who's the best running back during your era that you played against? So that's the question. And now we're going to hear the answer. <laughs> uh, I call him Wally P. But Walter Payton. Um, I'll tell you this story before I answer that. Walter um, always teased about how he would run over me. <laughs> you know, we'd be walking and he said, uh, hey, Mike, you know, he called me Mikey. Hey, Mikey, you know, you know I love you, right? But, but you know if ever, you know, if you and I ever went head to head, you know I'd have to drop the bone on you. Don't you? <laughs> I said, Wally P, just tell Coach Dicker to just let us go one time and we can answer all this. Earl Campbell. We have time for one more. We got one more question? Yes, sir. We'd like to know the relationship with his defensive coordinator, Buddy. Trying to keep my eyes dry. Um, I never thought I would be close to uh, Buddy Ryan at all. I, I did not like him at all. Uh, my first two years, he called me every name you could think of. And um, I really thought he hated me. As a matter of fact, I was going to go ask to be traded my second year uh, because uh, one day he just got on me and did not get off. And I'm sitting out there on the curb, and I'm thinking, I, I, you know, the guy hates me. I'm never going to get a chance to, to do anything. And then I have a guy come up to me, one of my teammates, uh, who was still very close to this day, Jim Osborne. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out how am I going to say this? How am I going to say I want to be traded? So Jim says, uh, hey, Mike, what are you doing? I'm getting ready to go up and ask to be traded. For what? And I said, but he hates me. He said, Mike, he loved you. What? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. He, I, I, he, he loved me? He said, Mike, he loves you. He, he just wants you to be quiet. <laughs> you know, everything Buddy would say, you, you know, and, and, and I would go, well, I'm trying to do it the way you want me to do it. And don't holler at any of his guys. You know, if I hollered at Dan, he had favorites now. He had Dan Hampton. He had Alan Page. He had Doug Plank. He had uh, Gary Campbell. If I hollered at any of them, and I'm about, hey, middle linebackers have guys get in the huddle and be quiet. 
But they're getting in the huddles. They're talking about what they did last night at the party and whatever. And I'm like, hey, let's go. And Buddy would say, son, do you know who that is? I'm a rookie coming in. I said, I don't care who he is. He's in this huddle. And if he's in the huddle, he's going to be quiet. And Buddy would shake his head or something like that or, or say, make a comment. But after a while, I began to understand when Jim Osborne told me to be quiet, that's what I did. And when I closed my mouth, the relationship began to build. And I just began to take whatever he had to say and, and listen and earn the right to speak. And um, that's how the relationship grew. Hey, thank you very much. God bless you. Why don't you guys help me continue to thank our guest speaker today, Mike Singletary. Also, we want to thank uh, our sponsor, Martin Marietta, for the incredible support of this event. A huge thanks to all of you for supporting the Touchdown Club's mission of citizenship, scholarship, sportsmanship, and leadership. And uh, I want to remind everyone as you exit, next month's luncheon is July 15th. Next month, July 15th, and I'm not sure if you guys saw it, but how many wolf pack we have in the house? Any wolf pack? July 15th, next month's speaker, all-time great Philip Rivers. You guys have a great afternoon and have an awesome, safe weekend. Thank you for coming out.